Slutty Vegan is an anomaly mm -hmm. because it's not just about food. It's about the experience. It's about the community work that we do. It's about how we give back to the community. It's about the nonprofit organization. It's about how we are a good representation of Black excellence, how we are breaking down all barriers and we're redefining all narratives. People think Black-owned businesses aren't organized. They're not clean. Oh, my restaurant is always clean, right? We make sure my books are always tight and clean, right? Like, so we're showing you that, like, no, this is not just a Black-owned business. This is a business that's successful, that's thriving that's continuing to grow and bringing the community with it. All right, listen, man. I got a free gift for you. Sponsored by my brother, Mark Wall Russell. Listen, he is going to give you the paid ad playbook. I asked him to give it to you and I was like, yo, you got to give it to him for free. He said, all right. So he's going to teach you the five by five by 25 method. Now, I can't teach you that because I don't know what as good as Mark Wall. However, if you get the paid ad playbook, he's going to teach you this thing that has attracted, that's attracting four clients, 50 to 100 leads every single day. I'm talking about leads that actually convert. To this date, to this date, it's generated over $250 million in revenue for coaches, consultants, course creators, and experts in their field, okay? So listen, it's a 14-page action guide um, that's more valuable than 99% of these 997 courses that's out there, how I know, because I got them all, okay? And, and he's going to give you a bonus, bonus training that's going to help you strategically strategize your own system. Strategically strategize, strategize your whole set. You need a strategy, fam. So listen, do me a favor, go to socialproofgift.com, socialproofgift.com. I certify, okay? He's the first person to help me make $30,000 in a week. It was crazy. No cap, okay? So go to socialproofgift.com. Check it out. It's free, absolutely free. Or text PROOF, P-R-O-O-F, PROOF, to 904-447-5274. The number's here. Website's here. Back to the episode. Welcome to another edition of the Social Proof Podcast, where you find dope people to do dope stuff. We are now the number seven entrepreneurship podcast in the country, which only makes sense to have the number one entrepreneurship. <laughs> the number one, you're like the number one <laughs> vegan entrepreneur, number one black female Damn. entrepreneur. You are like killing the game. Pinky Cole, how are you? That's a big title, but I'm going to take it. You know you look good. <laughs> you know Thank you. I'm humbled. Oh, my God. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Oh, no doubt. So yeah. the, the Slutty Vegan CEO, you have Bar Vegan. Yeah, know? I'm the it? CEO of Slutty Vegan, CEO of Bar Vegan, co-founder and CEO of um, Dinkies. Dinkies? Dinkies. What's that? Derek and Pinkies. It's a new Philly cheesesteak concept. Yeah, What's up with you right I'm now? I'm Jamaican. I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I do everything. Philly cheesesteak, is it like... Steak Philly or vegan steak Philly? Yeah, it's a vegan Philly cheesesteak. Have vegan. you ever been to Big Dave's cheesesteaks? I have. Yeah, so it's the vegan version of that. And he's wow. my partner in that concept. Really? Yeah. How'd that come about? Um, <laughs> just talking. <laughs> Was oh, that a trick okay. question? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, but... um, <laughs> right along. Okay. I got uh -huh. a lot of concepts, you know. Um, mm. I just love entrepreneurship. Clearly. Like, I love the grind. I love the art of business. I don't care if I was selling toilet tissue to a to a, to a toilet. Like, mm -hmm. I just love business. Yeah. So I just find new ways to create and manifest the things that I think about all the time. Amazing. I, I do yeah. want to just get this out front that uh, you're expecting now. Look, you can't wait to put that. I, I can wait. Because <laughs> nobody knew. I'm pregnant with possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am expecting. Let me... So... First off, this journey of uh, being pregnant, nobody knew. Nobody? No. How, why? Why? How did you not show it? Or um, Well, you know, my whole life is on public display now, mm. right? Um, you know, people see the businesses that I have. I'm always on camera. I always talk to people. So I just wanted to keep a piece of me sacred, right? Mm. Up until now, yeah. when I'm ready to really, like, have the conversation. Yeah. Um but I'm excited to now be a mommypreneur, yeah. right? So I feel like I have opened up a new lane for women who have kids and they just want to be bosses and CEOs, right? So now I'm going to be the example that you could do it. Um, and obviously I didn't get pregnant for that reason. But, <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, but yeah, I've done a lot in the past almost nine months. Um, the whole time I've been pregnant, you know, this has been the most crucial piece of my business. And I've been pregnant opening up new businesses in a pandemic. I've been pregnant mm. when I bought a $1.4 million property, pregnant when I bought a, all of my real estate. Like, I've been pregnant for a long wow. time and I did a lot. Um, so we're here. 
Goodness gracious. And, and it's a, two of us, and I'm hot. <laughs> and you're having a baby girl, right? I'm having a baby girl, yes. Good. I know you're probably, because my wife, we just went through it, and uh, my wife would talk to the baby, and mm-hmm. um, I like to know what those type of conversations are. Like, what are, you, what are you saying to your unborn child? What are the things that you really, really want to teach this young, beautiful Black girl that's about to come into this world? Um, well, it's not so much just teaching her. It's really just duplicating myself. I'm making a, a little me, mm. right? This is the person that's going to, to handle that. <laughs> this is the person that's going to carry on my legacy. Like she already has a house in her name already. She ain't even out the womb yet. You know what I mean? Like I'm really recreating myself and making a better version of myself. So she's always there when I'm on my conference calls, right? Wow. <laughs> when I'm talking or yelling at my yeah. team, like she is there. So she is getting a piece of the entrepreneurship and I don't even have to directly teach her. She's just absorbing all of that good energy about business. So I'm excited about mm. what kind of human being she's going to be when she's born. She about to be a star because I would yeah. love to be your child. Like, I, <laughs> I would on. love to hear them like Can I follow you in my taxes? <laughs> 100%. Hey, Joe, hit both of those AC units because I know how it is. <laughs> Well, I don't know, but for my wife, yes, we, joint, we gotta, put we it on thirty-five right, right now, please. <laughs> Damn, is that so? So, what, you've had some amazing successes in business. Walk me back to how you became this pinky coal that the world knows now. Um, well, I've always been the same pinky coal, mm-hmm. and that's the beauty of like being a business owner and a CEO. Like a lot of us, just got it mm-hmm. right. Um, and I've been doing this all of my life. Like you I was just born with it. It's like Maybelline. <laughs> Is high-level <laughs> entrepreneurship innate? Yeah, I believe so. Um, and I'll be honest, the day that I was born, my father, who was also an entrepreneur, an illegal one, but he was an entrepreneur, mm. right? He was being sentenced to life in prison. Um, so I got a lot from my dad and I got a lot from my mom. My mom was a part-time entrepreneur, but she was also a slave to a company for mm. three decades, right? My father spent 22 years in prison, but he still had the entrepreneurial mindset. So I got the best of both worlds. Your I got dad was in the 22 years before you got here or during? He got or? the day that I was getting pushed out. He was being sentenced. Mm. Yeah, the, the very day. So I came into freedom and he was losing his. Right. So I learned a lot about entrepreneurship even before I could open up my mouth or walk or crawl or anything. Um, So growing up in a single parent household, my mother is Jamaican. My whole family is Jamaican. Right. So I learned about hustle. I learned about grit. I learned about like not asking for handouts and like getting the things that you want on your own. And I saw my mother do that working for somebody else. And she was also a musician and a radio personality. So I got that personality from my mother. And then my father was in prison. You ain't got nothing to do but go to school, right? (laughs) So he's reading books, telling me about books, telling me about stocks, teaching me about how to be an entrepreneur. From From prison, from federal prison. Right. So I got all of those things at an early age. So I just always was a hustler. I didn't play with toys. I didn't watch cartoons because my grandmother lived at home. So I'm watching Lifetime and Golden Girls. You know what I mean? So like I was a lot more mature than my counterparts. So I just remember always envisioning myself bigger than life. Like I'm going to be a star. I don't know what I'm going to be doing, but I'm going to be big. I'm going to make it. That was my conversation always growing up. And it just carried me on till today. Do you remember a moment as a childhood, like something in your childhood that shaped like this belief? Like, is there a moment, like a turning point? Absolutely. Um, I can remember I was 14 years old. My family was always well known. We were just different, right? Yeah. I wasn't the average Black American. Like, yeah. you know, you I don't know if you know any Caribbean people, but yeah. like growing up in a Jamaican household is like growing up in a third world country. It's different, <laughs> right? Um, so... I can remember I was always popular my whole life because my name was Pinky. So people wanted to know, like, why is this girl's name Pinky? Pinky is your real name. Aisha is my real name. Aisha. But nobody calls me that. But you've been Pinky since a kid. Since the day that I was born. Right? My teachers, everybody calls me Where Pinky. Where does the name come from? Um, my godmother said that I was pink, so we're just going to call her Pinky. And that has been my pet name ever since. Really? <laughs> ever since. <laughs> Everything. Middle school, elementary, high school. Gotcha. So I was 15, 14 years old, and I started throwing parties. And I was doing the kind of parties where... Those parties of... Oh, yeah, I was doing it. Again, 14-year-old today is not the 14-year-old back then, right? In 2001, I was 14 years old, so that's a big difference, right? Like, I was independent, had a job, had all these things. Mm. So I used to throw parties, and I used to charge $10 to get into those parties. And, 
like a thousand people would show up. I'm talking about all the high school students from the city. And they would come and they show up for me. And rest in peace to Kay Swift. I don't know if you know who that is, but she was a big DJ in Baltimore. She used to DJ my parties. And a couple other people used to really DJ my parties. And I had the whole city coming out. So I can remember sitting on the floor with my mother, who at the time probably was only making $35,000 a year. And I was counting $4,000 on the floor. We mm. rubber man and money like it's the drug game. And I'm 14 years old. Then going to school and getting decent grades. Not the best grades, but decent, because school was never my thing. <laughs> right, right. Um, but that was kind of like my first experience of like, oh, like, I don't have to work for nobody. You know what I'm saying? Like, to see that kind of money. And it wasn't about the money, because it's never about the money. It's about the ability to create opportunities for myself and my family and for other people and to just put things together. Like, I love putting people and things and places together. And I was able to do that. And then I just got hungry after that. Mm, so obviously, fourteen. What grade? What grade is that? Is that ninth grade? That's the ninth grade. Ninth grade. Yeah. So you had a lit high school career. Oh, I was lit. <laughs> Everybody was, knew me. I was lit. Goodness gracious! So <laughs> how did you decide on going to college? Did you went to Clark? Yep, I went to Clark Atlanta. So they're, they're, I'm telling you a lot of stuff on this podcast that I have not shared with anybody. <laughs> I actually got expelled from high school. Really? Um, yeah. I got expelled from high school. I, I got into an altercation. I won prom queen. I was super popular. I won prom queen and got into a fight and I, I hit a girl and I got arrested. It was just a whole lot of stuff. Mind you, I'm in high school. And I got expelled from all Baltimore City public schools. I went to the best high school in Baltimore. And I wrote a letter to the superintendent about two months later and they accepted me into the second all-girls high school. Um, well, the second all-best high school, which was an all-girls school called Western High School. Oh, you got expelled from the first high school. I got school. expelled from the first for one. The, for fighting. For fighting. Is it your fault? Yes. You but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> you clearly won, but... <laughs> Win, lose, or draw. I was out of order, right? Like, right. I was just... I don't know. I probably was rebellion. Rebelling. Mm -hmm. um, so I, w I graduated from my all-girls high school called Western High School. And I'm like, I want to go to Clark Atlanta. And how I found out about Clark Atlanta University, I was watching MTV mm -hmm. and Ludacris surprised the students. And that was my first taste of college. And that was the reason that I wanted to go to college. Oh, wow. And at 17 years old, I packed up my bags and I drove down to Atlanta and the rest was history. Mm. Yeah. With the idea to do what in Atlanta? I don't. I didn't have an idea. I just wanted to just do something different, right? I was the first in my family to go to college. When I got there, the first set of people I saw were Deltas. And mm -hmm. I'm just like, ooh, I want to do that. I want to do that. I'm doing all of that. <laughs> and then the next thing I know, I did all of that, right? I became a Delta. I was Miss Junior. I was a part of every organization. I eventually became Miss Clark Atlanta University. Like, I did everything. I was like the, the face of the institution by the time it was time for me to leave. And I'm like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to become the woman that I knew that I always was. And, mm -hmm. and utilize the skill sets that I learned growing up. And that was the best experience of my life, to be honest, because going to Clark Atlanta University really shaped me um, and, and fostered all the things that I always thought about. So, you know. That's crazy. You got to be careful what you show you because you see something, you're like, yo, I'm going to get, oh, Clark, that's the one? Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, well, so I'm thank you, you Ludacris. I want that. Like, <laughs> goodness gracious. Ludacris, it, it, I owe a lot to him, right? And mm. MTV, so thank you. <laughs> Is there anything you think you can't do? Oh, I, there, anything I touch turns to gold. That's the mindset that I got, right? And that's not even like a cocky statement. Like, I'm just confident in my belief in myself, right? Like, people people used to tell me no all the time. And no just gave me the motivation and the ammunition to just keep going. Like, I can walk into You can't tell me no, right? There's mm -hmm. no nobody in the world. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a billionaire, millionaire. I don't care if you got 10 times more money than me. You cannot tell me no. Because no is just, you know, Popeye when he got the greens, right? Mm -hmm. That's how it feels to me when you tell me, no, it's just going to make me work harder. So anything that I want to do, I do, and I get it done. And when does that not serve you, right? Because every, every trait we have, is, it's awesome. But when does it not, when does it backfire? It never backfires to me. And I know that sounds cliche, but I'm a thinker. I'm an mm. analytical thinker. If I come up with an idea, I done thought about all the ways that it could go wrong before I present it. I done thought about all the ways that something could happen before I present it, before I talk about it. But I think about things so much that when I really say, okay, and put my mind to something that I'm going to do it, it's going to work for me. And even in the flesh, if it don't seem like it's going to work, it's a lesson learned. It's just helping me to get better. You know what? I think that's my issue. Because I have that, that ambition. Like, I see it. I want it. Mm -hmm. But I think what makes you different is... Um, 
your 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 main your mind is probably going to process all the thing the opportunity cost Everything. of it. Yeah. I just see it. Oh, let's do it. We out there. You're not going <laughs> to tell me no. And I'm telling a hundred people, you're not going to tell me no, and I get burnt out. Yeah. No, I think about everything, and and I, I, my mindset is like I'm always rooting for Plan A. Plan B doesn't even exist to me. Plan A is going to work and I'm going to make sure that it works because it literally is all about the belief Mm -hmm. and what you think about. And it's all about, like, if, again, when I was a kid, I said that I'm going to be famous, I'm going to be a star. The power of the tongue is so real. So if you believe in yourself to the the point where nothing else can shape that narrative, then what you want, you're going to get, no matter what. It might not come today, but it's going to come. And I've learned that. I've learned it with Slutty Vegan. I've learned it with the first restaurant that I had. Like, everything that I say that I want to do, I'm going to do. And even now, I got a team to help me do that. So any idea, if I wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I want to do a documentary. That's what's happening right now. My documentary is coming out August 6th. I got a whole team that's doing everything. And I don't even have to think about it no more. I done did all the analytical thinking. I processed it. I passed it on. And now I got a documentary. So I get to do the things that I want. Goodness gracious. <laughs> college. So college. What was your major? Mass media arts. Mass media arts. With a arts. concentration in radio, television, and film. And a lot of people don't know this, but I've never had an internship. Ever. Mm. I graduated college like, okay. All right, what's next? <laughs> and it's funny because... When I was graduating, I got an opportunity to work for Teach for America. Are you familiar with Teach for America? So Teach for America is basically like a program where you teach students uh, between second and eighth grade or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I never wanted to be a teacher, not in a classroom setting, right? Um, So I kept declining the interviews and it kept calling me back. And I kept declining. I was a student leader. So you Mm -hmm. know how that goes. Um, So I finally took it because I didn't have anything lined up. And they offered me 40. After you graduate? Or, or After I graduated. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I took the job. And I'm going to tell you this story. It's a very funny story about following your dreams. I took that job. I moved to Houston with my dog and no money. And I was out there for five days. And I'm like, okay, God, this ain't me. I don't want to do this. And uh, my friend gave me $40 to go to the airport. And I went to the airport and that's all I had. I did not have enough money to buy a plane ticket for myself. And I did not have enough money to buy a plane ticket for my dog. And this guy from Southwest Airlines walked up on me and I was crying. He was like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, you know, I'm just trying to figure out my life. Like, you know, everything is just in shambles. I'm just trying to figure everything out. He said, I'll be right back. He came back with $250 something, which was enough money for me and my dog to get on the plane. And I never looked back after that. And what I learned about that, that was a real, life lesson. Mm. I will never do anything that my spirit doesn't lead me to. I don't care if my mm. mother tell me. I don't care if my father tell me. Just do it for now. No. If my spirit tells me don't do it, I'm not going to do it because that was the first and the last time I ever did it. And I'm so glad that I left because after that, it afforded me the opportunity to go to LA. So you went for, This is just an, an, <laughs> an amazing interview. Where did you fly from? I mean, where'd you fly to? I flew back to Atlanta. Back to Atlanta. Yeah. Damn, I'm giving you the real tea. <laughs> I flew back to Atlanta and, and I was in a relationship at the time um, and he had a baby. Um, so that was obviously a difficult transition for me because we were together for about seven years. And then I said, you know what? I'm moving to Los Angeles. And I packed up my suitcase, a duffel bag and a Bible and I had $250. My mother printed me out 30 resumes, no lie. And I went to LA by myself, didn't know anybody. I knew people, but I didn't Where connect with stay? anybody. Oh, I went on Craigslist. And I found someone, I'm, I'm a risk taker. Like, I'm crazy. Thank God I'm still alive. <laughs> but I'm a risk taker. So I went out there. I found an apartment off of Craigslist. I was sleeping on a guy's floor. It was a disaster. Um, and then I found another place on Craigslist. So for about a year and a half, I was sleeping in a room with four other people. And we were paying $300 each. This is a true story. I'm putting this in my book. Oh my but God. we were paying $300 each. And... Three of us was on one side of the room and the other two, we a were room, on the other. Not a, like you're sharing a, a, a little room, a room, a room in a three bedroom house. And there were other people in the other room. So it was a total of probably like nine of us living in the, the house. boarding house? It felt like that. Golly. But but everybody was hustling, right? So we all did background work. You know, in LA, everybody's doing background work, being an extra, right? So like we made a living doing well, that. You wanted to be an actress? Like I wanted to be an LA. actress. Okay, gotcha. I, oh. You know, like I'm dr- dramatic like that, right? So <laughs> that was my dream. But like right. you tell God your plans, God gonna laugh, right? Um, so I moved out there to be an actress. I was living in that house, made some lifetime friends, mm. learned a lot of lessons, was humbled a lot. Um, and then my sorority sister said, listen, you ain't got no money. Like, I'm going to give you a job. And she gave me a job working as a production assistant on a show called Judge Karen's Court. 
I don't know if you ever heard of that. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was so good at it. Mind you, I didn't have any TV experience. I just wanted to be in front of right. the camera. Um, and I got good at it. In about two months, I got promoted. I was a producer out of nowhere, right? Well, first off, hold on. So <laughs> a year and a half, yeah. you're just like taking odd end jobs? Yeah, like- I worked for the census. I worked for a candy store. I worked at DSW. I used to tell my bosses, like, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm like, mm. I'm going to be a star. I'm just telling you like that. And they would look at me like, all right, get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mind you, this is the person that was the queen of the South. Like, right, I'm a right. Delta, Clark Atlanta, and then I go to L.A. and I have nothing. I'm, like, living paycheck to paycheck, right? Um, but I needed that to happen, right? Because it taught me about, like, what to do when you finally get something. Like, you cherish it because I had nothing, right? But I had my mind, and that was more important. Mm. Um, so then you finally get a job. So so I, so I get the job. I'm working. Um, and I did so well that I got a call from New York City and they called me and said, hey, we heard a lot about you because, you know, in the TV industry, like people talk, if you're good, your reputation is all you have. Right. Forget the money. So they called me and said, hey, we want to bring you to New York City to work on a show called The Jeremy Cow Show. And I'm like, OK, hey, I ain't got nothing to lose. <laughs> and this was an extension of a British show from um, England. So I moved to New York, didn't know nobody in New York. Right. And I'm like, how did I get here? But I did so well. And here's another story I can remember because I'm just always committed to myself. I used to say, I used to live off $5 a week. What if I told you for $1, I will introduce you to hundreds of entrepreneurs every single morning this week. From all across the country, you'll be able to talk to hundreds of entrepreneurs and I'll coach you. I'll coach you for a dollar this whole week. And I'll introduce you to some of my successful friends for a dollar this week. Would you... Would you take part in that? Well, go to themorningmeetup.com because that's exactly what we're doing here, okay? The only organization that gathers entrepreneurs every single day for the betterment of entrepreneurship, okay? Every single day, Monday through Friday, we gather, we're growing, we're learning. We got a book club. Have you ever seen hundreds of entrepreneurs reading the same book? Every single chapter, every single day, we're growing together, okay? You need the environment to grow in. Themorningmeetup.com, a dollar. I'm gonna give you all this for a dollar. If you wanna stay, Great. It's $79 a month after that. If not, no obligation. You can leave whenever you want. All right? TheMorningMeetup.com. I'll see you in the morning. When I was working on that show in New York City, $5 a week, no lie. Wow. So they had something called Seamless. So if you stayed at work after 8 o'clock, you would get a free meal. Right. So I was so committed to saving my money. What I did was after 8 o'clock, all the people who wanted to leave... Uh, after eight and they didn't want the food, I said, okay, give me your food. So I would eat my food that night and I would save their food for the next day and eat their food for lunch and stay again and did, do it all over again. $5 got me to and from work on the train so I didn't have to spend any money. $5 a week, I saved so much money up. And while I was saving that money up, I got promoted to a producer. Were you saving for a purpose or this was just a part of your lifestyle of, I'm um, just- I am just, I'm a weirdo like that. Like, I'm a spiritual weirdo. Like, I just always find new ways to, like, challenge myself all of the time. And mm, So it's not about a growing bacon cow. It's just like, yo, yeah. I want to... Yeah. And, and a part of that is because I grew up, like, I didn't get... to be a billionaire. Do you understand this? I already know I say it all the time. I say that, and, and I believe that. And not just because of the money, but the things that I manifest, like, and it's like I'm proving something to myself, not anybody else. Um, so I got a call from the Maury show while I was working on that show and they said, Hey, we heard about you. We want you to come. And I'm like, y'all keep hearing about me. What are y'all hearing? (laughs) And they said that we want you to come to the show. And at the time I was 25. So I interviewed, they loved me. Um, I was a television producer for the Maury show for three years. So my Mm. background is TV, right? So I was working, um, as a producer for the Maury show. I met a friend and he was like, Hey, there's a restaurant available. Um, do you want it? Do you want to open up a restaurant? I'm like a restaurant. I I don't, yeah, I like to cook. I'm no no chef. And I had my 401k saved up. I had my money saved and I got vegan at this point. I was vegetarian. Vegetarian, So I stopped eating meat in 2007. Right. Now, real quick, just for timeline purposes, you graduated what year? 2009. 2009. When did you start working at Maury? 2012. So in three years, yeah. your life is just like a, a roller yeah. coaster of just, I'm yeah. just going at it. Whatever, wherever I'm led yep. and my brain takes me. Yeah. Three years. Three years. And the next thing I know, I'm working at the Maury Show. I have a Jamaican restaurant. Then a year later, I open up a juice bar in Harlem. I'm booming. Okay, hold on. <laughs> You're working at Maury, the Maury Show. Then you open up. So somebody says, hey, would you like to open up a Jamaican restaurant? Yeah. Were you a good cook? I'm. You know, I watched my grandmother cook. 
Again, I just love business. I went to Google and YouTube University, right? Yeah, walk, walk me through from the time where somebody says, you want a restaurant? To you open it. Yeah. Like, what's going on? Um, I'm like, hell yeah, I'll do it, right? I had the money to do it. Um, I created a menu at the time. I didn't eat chicken. I didn't eat oxtail. So I'm serving that. Um, and, and here's another lesson learned. I wasn't walking in my purpose because I didn't eat none of that. So I was selling it to people and I didn't even believe in it, right? So I knew that that wasn't going to work for the long term, but I needed to be in that moment so I can learn, right? Um, So I opened up the restaurant, no marketing, no advertising, no nothing, didn't know what I was doing. And I had a line down the block. People came to buy jerk chicken. And at the time... No, no, Pinky, no. (laughs) I need to know what happened. Like, is it you are just, just gifted in that way? Like people are attracted to you and your concepts or like... What did you do to get this block, this line around the block? It so, had to be something. So it was twofold. So at the time, I was in a relationship with somebody who was really popular in Harlem. Um, but I'm just not shy, right? And, mm. and I like to believe that I radiate when I walk in a room. You know what I mean? So, like, I, I like to talk to people. Like, and whoever you are, like, I don't change. I'm always the same to everybody. And I think that people ad- adapt to that. Um, so, so it did well. People supported me, which is why I was able to open up another business. And I, was, uh, I had the restaurant for two years, but I was hustling backwards. I was living in my business, right? All day, every day. I was 26 years old, working 15 hours a day. Then I'm lying to the people telling them jerk chicken tastes, tastes good. And I don't even eat jerk chicken, right? <laughs> I guess it did taste good because right. they can't keep come, coming back. Um, but yeah, so after two years, I got a call from the fire department saying that my restaurant was on fire. Yeah. And mm, I was... Very profitable, though. Yeah, yes. it was profitable. I mean, at the time, it was profitable. Did you quit Maury? So, so when the restaurant caught on fire, I was no longer working at Maury. Instead, I was working as a senior producer on a show called Paternity Court. I don't know if you ever heard of that show yeah. on Fox. Yeah. Hold on. This whole time, you got a job and a... I'm Jamaican. Yes. <laughs> I was doing everything. Um, oh, my gosh. Where so, you get these hours in a day? I know. I, I don't even know how I did it. Did you have a team back then? Um, no. I mean, I had employees, but it wasn't a team. Mm-hmm. Now I know what a team is, right? right? Um, so when they called me and told me my restaurant was on fire, I was devastated. I literally put my blood, sweat, and tears in the business. Um, so I literally lost everything. And another lesson here for the people that are listening to this, I didn't have fire insurance. Mm. So I wasn't able to recoup any of those funds. I wasn't able to get any money from the damaged equipment, nothing. So I went from making money in my business to getting evicted to my car getting repo to losing my relationship, fell apart, everything. And I'm like, all right, God, what are you trying to teach me? Hold on, hold on. First off, Joe, write that down, fire insurance. We were building another building around the corner. Please get it. Write that down. Get okay, all of it. <laughs> fire insurance. And so the, the restaurant goes ablaze. Yep. But you're working at paternity court at the time. Mm-hmm. Did you increase your lifestyle to where you needed that? You couldn't just live on the job or did you wind up quitting the job? So, I, so I ended up quitting the job. Um, after the fr- Yeah, the I've always lived a modest lifestyle, but the restaurant business is very hard. Mm-hmm. I don't care how much money you got in the bank. If something go wrong and you can't cover it, like that money will deplete fast, mm-hmm. right? Um, so when the restaurant caught on fire... I literally, it, it, and, and it was gradual. It, it felt fast, but it was gradual. But I literally lost everything. Because again, after that restaurant caught on fire, I still had to pay the bills for the other restaurant. Oh, because it was a juice bar? Yeah, it was a juice bar. Yeah. Um, so I fell into like a little depression. Well, what I thought was a depression, right? Um, and, and I got on food stamps. Like, it was crazy. I'm like, mm. this is the person that had all of these things, right? Um, so in a matter of, a few weeks, I don't remember exactly the timeline. One of my mentors, who was a producer for Catfish at the time, she called me. She said, hey, Iyala Fix My Life is hiring for a supervising producer. Oh, wow. Dude, I can't take the job because I'm working. Do you want to take it? And I'm like, hell yeah. I don't got nothing to lose, literally. <laughs> right. right? right. Um, so they asked me how much I wanted to make. And I said like a crazy number and they accepted it. They didn't even like, it wasn't a back and forth. They accepted it. I'm what like, was the number? I like it was $4,000 a week. Four thousand dollars. So a you week. say okay, four thousand dollars a week. Yeah, without the headache, I'm like four thousand dollars a week, and I ain't got to deal with the headache of a restaurant. Right. Absolutely, because I mean, 
by, by the time that you pay all the bills in a restaurant, I was kind of like bringing home that kind of money anyway. Right. So I'm like, absolutely. And at the time, I felt like I was going through a depression. I was sad because everything that I've always touched turned to gold except for this. So I was able to work on that show. And I think that that was the best experience for me um, because I learned about healing. I learned about acknowledging your stuff. And I was able to help other people at the same time. And I'm like, oh, this is a win-win. I'm getting money. I'm getting free therapy. Like, it was just a win-win for me. Um, So I got promoted. um, So I'm working as a casting director by this time, uh, like almost two years later. Um, And they called me and said, hey, Pinky, we want you to go to Atlanta. Right? I'm coming to the slutty. What was Ayana's? I Yanla. Yanla's show. It w- it was well Still in New York. We were based in LA, but like we would go to different places. So you had, you had to travel for this. Uh, yeah, so sometimes. So I didn't travel all the time because you. I was over like all the shows and making sure that we booked the shows and all oh, that. So you could have stayed you stayed in in New York with No, 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 no. I stayed in LA. I moved gotcha. to LA. They okay. moved me to LA. So I um, I moved to Atlanta from LA temporarily. Mm-hmm. Right. I put my one bedroom apartment in storage. That was in 2018. And would you believe my stuff is still in storage? Still in the same storage? Three years later. (laughs) $250 a month. I'm crazy. Um, But that just goes to show you how much Slutty Vegan has continued to grow that I haven't even had time to go back and get my stuff out of storage. Do you remember what's in there? Yeah, you, yeah. Do like a, I just, you need to do like an auction. Like, that's that's like antique, that's yeah. precious stuff. I would buy yeah. something and put it in my house. Like, yo, this was back when she was struggling. Yeah. You know well, I mean? you know what? It's funny because um, I actually got some decent stuff in there. Um, and I'm going to be opening up a location in LA. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to dust that stuff off. Hopefully it's still Jeez. in decent condition. And I can put it in my apartment when mm. I get there. Um, so I'm in Atlanta. And I'm in a house um, with my boyfriend at the time. And I'm I'm giving to you transparently, right? So I'm not a smoker, obviously, but I'm in the house and he's smoking a blunt. (laughs) And I'm like, give me some, let me try it. So like, I'm in my creative mode. I'm already creative, right? Um, And it just hit me like a light bulb. Slutty vegan out of nowhere. And again, I'm the type of person that I'm a visionary. I could We could sit down and I can come up with like 10, 20 ideas. Like, oh my gosh, this is a good idea. Let's do this. I'm just always like that with all of my friends. And when I came up with the idea out of nowhere, I called my best friend and she was like, it's an amazing idea. Do it. So I started researching. I started uh, looking at recipes. Then I got in the kitchen, started playing with some stuff. Um, and then one of my mentors, she was just like, you should call Prep ATL. Prep ATL is a shared kitchen. And I'm like, all right, let me call them. So in a matter of three weeks, I set up permits, my LOC. I did all of this stuff. And I, I got DoorDash, Uber Eats, and I turned it on. And I started selling burgers and fries. What year is this? This was in 2018, 2018. August 6th. 2018 was the day that I opened up the virtual doors. Did you create your did you create your own recipes? Yeah. Everything. You're not a chef though. I'm not a chef. You said you cook okay, but your food is amazing. Well, thank you. Um the secret is in the sauce, right? The the menu, the concepts, everything was me. I, you know, I was in the house and I was just coming up with all the stuff and I would call my friends like, "What do you think about this? Do you like this?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, I like that. No, I don't like that." And they would give me honest feedback and I was still working at the time. At this time, I'm making like $5,000 a week, so I'm doing good. Um, so when I opened up the first week, I had like four people coming. I'm like, dang, like I can't, this can't be no failure. Like what's going on? <laughs> um, but I didn't tell anybody. I didn't put it on Instagram. I didn't put it nowhere. I just turned on the delivery apps. And- so real quick, it's uh, the shared kitchen mm-hmm. in this business model. It's a shared kitchen and you can do DoorDash and all that stuff out of the shared kitchen. So yep. you don't need a restaurant to no. get on DoorDash. I was the first person to actually do that. They weren't even familiar. It, LA was already hip to it. But when I'm in Atlanta, when I was in Atlanta, they never heard about it. So I introduced it to them. And it was like, okay, we could try it out. And I did it. Um, and the second week, there was like 50 people. And the third week, it was like 100 people. So then I created an Instagram page. And people started DMing their orders. And I'm like, oh, they coming. So at the time, I was only taking cash. And I was just making so much money. And I'm like... I know somebody's stealing. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it was just so much money. But so yeah. many people started coming that the, the owners of the facility said, okay, all right, this is getting out of hand. The tenants aren't able to do their work. So we're wow. going to have to put you out of the kitchen. But if you get a food truck, then you can go into the parking lot and you can sell out the food truck. So again, I didn't know anything about food trucks. I didn't know anything about that. But I went to a place called Mr. V's in Atlanta. He's well known for like mm-hmm. restaurant equipment. And I'm like, hey, I need a food truck. He was like, we just worked on our first one for the first time. You can have it. 
And he was like, wow. it's $45,000. You got to put $10,000 down every single week. Y'all pay me $3,000. And I did that. It was like a lemon. But the, <laughs> the point of the matter is it made me a lot of money. So I got the food truck. Hold on real quick, though, because <laughs> you were you together. cooking the food? Yes. I was. It was three of us at the time. I had a cashier. I was in the kitchen. And then I hired like a pseudo chef. He wasn't a chef either. Um, but we were just preparing the food. And all the sauces, you just... Put it together. Everything. Yeah, oh, let's need a little more. Everything. Everything. And the next thing I know, I had this food truck and I had about three to 500 people every single day standing in line to patronize this little food truck right here in the parking lot of a shared kitchen. And the rest is history. I don't hear the genius marketing strategy and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Is it just the, like the food's amazing? You eat it once or like just for the, somebody that's building a restaurant right now and they're having a hard time because it seems like you turn it on, people eat, and more people eat next week and then the next week. But it had nothing to do with the food, right? It still doesn't have anything to do with food. Tell me, tell me this. What song. it is is I created an experience that made you want more. I gave it to you when I wanted to give it to you. So I would do pop-ups, random secret pop-ups, and I would post it on my Instagram three hours before, hey, we're going to be in Decatur in three hours. And everybody would swarm and run up. Hey, we're about to be in Stone Mountain. So we we weren't so predictable. And sometimes when you're not predict, predictable, people want you more. It's like a relationship, right? Like mm-hmm. leave something to the imagination. And we did that. And we treated it like that. We didn't, we weren't consistent with that piece of it. We just Gave it to you. And if you wanted it, you came and got it. Um, And then we created an experience, right? So I always tell people that when people come to Slutty Vegan, you don't come for the food. You come for the experience and then you leave with the food. Mm. And oftentimes people want to sell products. Products is not what's going to get you to the next level. It's the experience and a story that's going to get you to the next level. So what is the story here? The story is there's a girl from East Baltimore that created a concept that makes people feel good like they're going to Six Flags Adventure World Hershey Park. And it's a fun family family reunion style vibe. And we ain't talking about food because guess what? We're going to get you later with the food. Well, we're going to psychologically brain fuck you. Excuse my language. But when we do that, we, we make you feel so good that you don't even realize that we taught you about veganism and how to reimagine food. And by the time you finish eating it, you're like, damn, I can eat that again. That is the formula. Mm. That's exactly what it is. And, and, and I'll give you some examples of other companies that do it. Coca-Cola does it. Pepsi does it. They don't sell products. They sell experience, right? Which is why when you see their commercials, they're sell- they're, you, you see them on the beach. You see them with their best friend. They put names on the cans because they want it to be an intimate connection. And what I did is I researched them and I put my own spin to it, married with my professional producer experience and... It was just a recipe for success. Goodness gracious. And I know that it was like the first few months, like your first few months of building it. I, I think I seen somewhere you did like, I don't know, it's like $4 million, something crazy your first yeah. few months, first year, something like that. What was that? Yeah, you're right. My first year. First year. I did four. A little four over four. Million. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing a lot more than that now. I bet. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Yeah, and and it's a blessing because this is burgers and fries and pies, right? But again, Slutty Vegan is an anomaly Mm -hmm. because it's not just about food. It's about the experience. It's about the community work that we do. It's about how we give back to the community. It's about the nonprofit organization. It's about how we are a good representation of Black excellence, how we are breaking down all barriers and we're redefining all narratives. People think Black-owned businesses aren't organized. They're not clean. Oh, my restaurant is always clean, right? We make sure my books are always tight and clean, right? Like, so we're showing you that, like, no, this is not just a Black-owned business. This is a business that's successful, that's thriving, that's continuing to grow and bringing the community with it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a part of the reason why we're able to succeed. And we're intentional, right? Um, So when you talk about intention, like, like I'm very strategic on where I put my locations, right? In In the heart of gentrification. I want to have Slutty Vegan as a staple, going places where developers don't think it's so attractive because we're going to raise the property value up in the neighborhood. So it's little things and nuances like that that really set the business apart that's beyond burgers and fries. But that's also important because I want people who look like us to understand that like you can have options. I'm not telling you that you got to be vegan, right? You can be a flexitarian. You can eat beef, hell, I don't care. But when you come to Slutty Vegan, 
replace one item with something. And I know that you'll come back to Slutty Vegan or you'll actually go to another vegan restaurant and try some other options. For sure. And I thought it was just so dope, just the way you go about it, because there are people who aren't, and it goes to the experience, people who aren't vegan that come to Slutty Vegan, not because they want a vegan burger. Yeah. It's like, yo, I need the experience. I want to see what it's like, the curiosity. Yeah. And one thing I thought was so genius, <laughs> I was literally having a whole argument with, uh, with my <laughs> friends about you. And because you had like the two burger minimum, mm -hmm. right? And it was like, yo, they do the two burger minimum because they don't want to run out. And I was like, I don't think that's no, the that's case. No, that's not true. <laughs> I, if I'm going to get burgers and fries, I'm going to order a burger and fries. Mm -hmm. But because the, it's a two burger minimum, it's I gonna, get two burgers. It's going to make you want it, right? Listen, when you tell grown people something that they can't do, they're going to want it anyway. That's the shit. Like, I'm giving all the free smoke, right? So if I tell you, you can only have two and you... 50 years old and you telling me what I can have, you're going to get it just because somebody tried to limit you because we don't like to be limited. So mm. now, on average, every single person that stands in line on average buys two burgers, right? And then if they beg, like, please, can I get more? Right. Okay, we'll make the exception. We really will give it to you, right? right but like, right. we'll make the exception. And then it makes you feel special, right? It makes you feel like, damn, like, I could get more than two burgers, right? <laughs> this is grown people. But it, but, it, but it's all a oh formula, and the formula has always worked. It's sometimes in life, right, you don't have to give everything at one time. Give it in phases. Give it in pieces. Give You create your own narrative. Give the people what you want to give the people. And when you create your own narrative, people will oblige by that, and they, they will want to be a part of it. And, and we're authentic with it. Like, nothing that we do is fake, Right. Nothing is for like if anybody knows me, how I'm talking to you, this is me all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Like organic, authentic. And that translates to my business. When you walk in the door, my employees scream at you and they hug right. you, loving on <laughs> Call you. Call like, sluts and burgers yeah. and stuff like that. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> yes. But it's a beautiful violation. Yeah, right. Right. But right. it has nothing to do with sex. It's really redefining words, uh, you know, redefining power two words and just showing people that like it, it it can be raunchy and racy and still sophisticated and you can still learn along the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So with with the 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 meteoric rise mm -hmm. of slutty vegan, what has been some of the challenges? Because I mean something growing that fat and that's why I was saying um before this, I was so impressed with you because when I met you when you spoke at the event, slutty vegan was kind of new. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you've continued to grow year after year, like it wasn't, it wasn't a trend or a fad, mm -hmm. right? So you having that that just quick rise, what were some of the challenges and how did you start to manage that? Um, well, obviously any business is going to go through some tribulations, right? We just make it look good, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the biggest things is just finding the right team. Right. Um, when I first started Slutty Vegan, I found all my employees off Instagram. <laughs> really? And I'm like, well, maybe that's not the best way to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, but I mean, some of it worked, right? Mm -hmm. Because I got people that are still with my company that have been with me since day one. Um, but 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 just finding the right people that 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 are in alignment with what you believe in, that are visionaries like you. And that is probably one of the biggest lessons that I've learned. Um, you can't work for me if you just want a paycheck. Like it, it, it don't work. Right. Because I don't work for money. Mm -hmm. And if you work for money, then we're not on the same page. I, OK, I, I, I got to ask this, too, because I have a kind of like a, a kiosk in a mall in the mall or in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. It's only so much you can pay a person. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you manage? OK, I'm only going to pay you a certain amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. I, I just you just can't you can't pay somebody six figures to flip burgers. Right. right. How do you find the people who are willing to take a smaller pay, but their output is so great. Like, how do you manage that? Incentivize them. So if you work in my company for at least a year, I give you equity in the company. What? Yep. Um, if you are on the corporate side, you get full life insurance that we pay for. I'm talking about the real kind. Life insurance and full <laughs> benefits, kind. full coverage. Right. Um, so like the real kind, right? So the kind where you can go to the dentist and your copay ain't going to be like $500, right? right, right, right. right? Um, and we pay for that. For a small company to do that, it's very impressive because most small very companies can't do that. Um, we, we, we give raises um, where necessary. I also pay my crew members tips, right? So um, all the tips that the customers give to them, they keep 100% of their tips. Mm. So you could actually write your own ticket, right? Um, and then we, we have a competitive pay. So when you first come into Slutty Vegan as a crew member, you get $9 plus tips, which is about $12. Mm. And then in three months, you get $12 plus tips, which can equal out to about $15. So 
the, 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 the friendlier you are, the more customer service, good customer service that you give, you can get tips. And these customers, oh, they tip. They tip a 100%. lot of money, right? Um, and the fact that you are a part of a growing empire, that just speaks for itself. So the in- incentivizing the employees is very important because that's kind of like the only way that you want to keep them, to be honest. And, and I've, learned, I've learned that the hard way because I didn't always do that in the beginning. But then I said, okay, all right, what I'm going to do? What I'm going to do is give them a piece of my company through phantom equity, right? So as long as you with me and you rock out with mm-hmm. me, if I decide to sell this company, then you're going to walk away with a nice check right. and you ain't got to get another job. And there's an opportunity for you to one day have first rights of refusal to franchise your own slutty vegan when we get to that point. So I bring it back to my point that like, I don't like having people working for me that are working for a paycheck because it's bigger than that. Right. There's people in my company that I promoted three times in one year. But when you make it to the one year mark, I show you that you show show up for me. I'm always going to show up for you. I suck as a leader <laughs> no, and a business don't. owner. My God. No. Who, who? Don't no, 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 you know. go to a <laughs> But it ain't always easy because yeah. what I've also learned, you asked me what were some of the tribulations. I've also learned that there were some people that were in my company early on that had a sense of entitlement because they helped to grow the company. And it's like, mm. you owe me. And I owe nobody nothing. Right. right? If, especially if I'm paying you, nobody's doing, you know, volunteer work. But that was kind of one of the hurdles that I had to go through. Like people who showed up and felt like that they needed a bigger piece of the business, but it doesn't work like that, right? Because it came from here. Mm-hmm. Um, a- another hurdle is the fact that, you know, we're having staffing issues now um, on the crew level side. Right. Because now everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, which is a, an amazing thing. Yes. It's an amazing thing. I can't even get mad at that. For sure. Right? So through this pandemic, people started cooking their own food and selling plates, mm-hmm. right? Starting their own businesses. And I'm like, yes, finally people are doing it. But now as a business owner, like it's a crutch. It's hurting me. But you yeah. know what? I appreciate the fact that more people want to work for themselves and create their own opportunities. Yeah. But yes. everything else has been a breeze. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So they, they were having issues in restaurants where people are leaving and not coming back because the government gives them so much money and yeah. there's so much money floating around the economy. So if they come up with a product, it's easier to be successful in that yeah. way. But I feel like the, the way you structure your commission and people buy into the vision, because not everybody works for money mm-hmm. and they'll buy into a vision. And those are the people that you want, yeah. not just looking at this amount of money right here, mm-hmm. I'm looking at, yo, I believe in Pinky yeah. and where she's going. Mm-hmm. And if she sell this joint, I'll never have to work another day in yes. my life. Or even if I go public, who knows? Mm. Are you going public? <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, to be honest, again, I'm telling you stuff that I don't even ever talk about. Um, when we think about going public, Slutty Vegan is a community-based business, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I get a lot of love from people. 100%. Right? Like, people love Slutty Vegan. Like, can't nobody talk about me because people be ready to fight. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> calm down. Um, but it, it feels good to know that if I do decide to do that one day, then I'm given the opportunity for people who have supported me from day one to be able to buy shares in my company. Yeah. That's a great feeling. Yeah. I remember one time I called my lawyer like, hey, I want to do some crowdfunding. And all my lawyer employees, he was like, okay, calm down, slow down. <laughs> but I say all that to say, like, I wouldn't be where I am if it mm-hmm. wasn't for the people of Atlanta mm-hmm. and beyond who support me. So... I, I thought about it. Um, the pros and cons of going public. Um, well, first of all, your business is in the streets when you go public. Like yeah. everything, you got to report everything. The world sees your business, yeah. your finances, if, you, if you're red, if you're green, everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the pro is, is that you obviously can raise more money um, when you go public, right? And then the early founders, like the early people in the business, the shares that they have early on can triple. Look yeah. at Facebook. The people who got the early shares in Facebook are damn near billionaires now. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um but then you have private equity companies. If you want to sell your business, to be honest, that's not at the forefront of where I am. I'm really just focused on making Slutty Vegan a household name and putting it in different cities and just creating a telltale story of how this young girl from East Baltimore that was thick, that had locks, created <laughs> the, this, this worldwide company that became a national brand that people love. And it wasn't a trend. It, it stayed around and teach people about veganism in the funnest way possible. Who tried to buy your company? Everybody. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. I know that the, the, the offers were coming. Listen, I mean, it slowed down a little bit, but I, once upon a time, I was getting about 20 requests a day. Almost all the biggest companies you could think of reached out to me. Hold on. To franchise or to buy the company? Both. Oh. Franchise, invest, buy. Like, I have a whole roster probably had like 4,500 people on it now. 
every time somebody emails, we just hold on to it. You never know just who might use them. Just in case. <laughs> just in case. Um, but what's, that tells me that we were doing something right, right? What's the biggest offer you got? Um, well, not not a monetary offer. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, we want to do this. But obviously, we want an acquisition. We would like to, like, you know, the people who are serious, that's mm-hmm. how they talk. Like, acquisition. Acquisition. We'd like to talk to you. Like, they're yeah. not just going to throw out no number. It don't work mm-hmm. like that, right? Not the real folks, anyway. Right. Um, Have you ever entertained any of the no. meetings? Mm-mm. Just to see what's going on, um, see what's happening? No, we responded on email. Um, but I've also made some really good connections with people mm-hmm. who want to invest. Yeah. Uh, the right people, right? Because you don't want to get in bed with everybody. Um, but, have you worked with investors already? Um, yes. You got some? Okay, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, who's actually my mentor? I'm actually about to do a big round um, to really scale the business. Who's this up. mentor? Uh, I got a couple. Um, so Richie Lou Dennis, he owns... Um, Essence Magazine, yes. Essence Festival. Yeah. Shaka Zulu, who's also my manager. Um, he used to manage Ludacris. Manage Ludacris, mm-hmm. yeah, okay. Um, Full circle stuff. Yeah. Boycott Cummins, like South African, just tons of business and money. Mm. <laughs> uh, I got I got a lot of people. Randy Giroudi, he's the CEO of Shake Shack. I got some... It, it's funny because I got a lot of wow. masculine energy around me. <laughs> but um, I got a lot of good people in my corner, people that I could pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I got a question. I need an idea. You know, I got an idea what you think about this. And I also got a really good number too. His name is Jason Crane. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's been my friend for a long time. He, he sold his own company before called Part Pit. Mm. Um, are you familiar with Part Pit? No, no, no. Oh. Um, so he sold his company to Amazon. So, he, you know, he used to work at Google, Shazam. So now he's my number two. And he helps with strategy of the business. So, gotcha. so I got a, a really good team. And I got a good team of, oh, Kasim Reed is one of my mentors. Really? Yeah. Golly. Listen, he done got me out of a lot of hot water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That was my, that high up? You got to yes. visit Atlanta? Yeah. Oh, yeah no good. problem. Right. What you <laughs> Um, but yeah, so like I have some really good people in my corner and, and that helps me a lot. As of today, how many how many locations? Do I have? Yes. I have three active locations, two food trucks, and I'm opening three more this year. Birmingham construction has already started. Okay. Birmingham, Alabama. Um, New York, I'm signing my paperwork by the end of the week. Wow. And then I'm opening in Gwinnett County this year. Um, we have some airport opportunities that are happening, so we'll probably be open like oh, third you quarter crazy next year. In the airport. <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh. Um I've also done trash in the airport. Yeah. Man. And then I opened up my fourth location, which is Bar Vegan Dinkies in Pont City Market. Mm-hmm. So we're one of the top businesses doing well over there too. Always mm. packed. You should check it out. I'm gonna have to check that out. Yeah. So what? It's lit. It'll be lit over there? It's lit. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, and I'm oh. actually opening up my my second and my third bar vegan. Um, we're, we're in negotiations right now. So. Where at? New York and LA. Yeah, That's I'm working. In, in Atlanta, we got because I, I saw that is is um, Edgewood open. Edgewood is open. So yeah. okay, yeah, I, I was driving by. And this was like a couple of months ago, and it was, seemed like it was because it hasn't been open that long, right? Edgewood has been open since October. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. That, that, that makes sense. I saw, the, I saw the sign. I said, that pinky cool. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. It's not easy, though. I'm not even going to lie. It's hard. Listen, I'm a stickler for reviews, mm-hmm. right? Like, so, like, I, I always tell people, like, the money ain't my... I'm a magnet to money. I'm going to get that, right? So, my, my number two, he deals with all the money stuff. You can have all those conversations. I don't care, but I care about experiences, mm-hmm. right? So, like, if we get a bad review, I take it personal. It's bad. <laughs> I've gotten a lot better, but, like, if we right. get a bad review, I'm like, what happened? Like, I will call a customer myself. We got mm-hmm. a whole customer service team because, like, we are obsessed with the consumer because they are the people who pay our bills, right? Um, so, I'm always, like, a stickler on that. So, when I say it's hard, like... I am trying to find a balance between not taking it personal Mm -hmm. because my name is all over this, right? And like, that's all I got is my name. And that's what I care about. But I think those entrepreneurs are the entrepreneurs that do the best. Look at Jeff Bezos. Like, they're obsessed with customer service at Amazon. You don't like your product, you don't get a new product. And and just following leaders like that just showed me that like, as long as I continue to do that, then the business will continue to be successful. Got you. Um, So the the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. First off, are you franchising? No, no time soon. No time soon. And and the reason why I'm not I was is talking we, to Corey. He said she gonna give me one. <laughs> so, shout out to Corey with support like house. He said oh she gonna give oh, me one. Oh that's my guy. Um the reason why I'm not doing it right now is because there's a very specific experience when you come to Slutty Vegan, and I am at the moment trying to figure out how to duplicate that experience outside of Atlanta, mm. right? So I don't want to give my baby to somebody else and they jack yeah. up the experience and right. I walk in the store and ain't nobody talking to like me. Like the I'm founder, like, yeah. Like I'm when like, they started yes. selling, uh, what was they sell like? Uh, they, yeah, started they started doing something different. About kind of Right, and I'm like, yeah, and I'm not ready to do that, right? right? Because I would have a panic attack. Um, (laughs) But maybe down the future. So 
where we are now is really just continuing to streamline the business. I, I got a co-packer to like package all of my stuff. So now I don't have hands having to do everything. We tear the bag and pour, mm, right? Um, nice. I got a co-packer to manufacture my sauce. So now my brother doesn't have to make sauce every single day, making like 15 buckets of sauce for wow. all three restaurants. Mm -hmm. So we're streamlining the business, um, building up our operations. I just got a new director of operations. And that's what's important to me because you can't really scale unless you have those things down pat. For sure. And we're in a really good place, but we still got some ways to go. Yeah. And that's the transparent part of it. I ain't right. about to sit here and like, guess everything is beautiful. <laughs> oh, some days it gets hard. I bet. I, I, bet. I cry sometimes. I'm frustrated <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes I'm over it, but mm -hmm. all of the time it's always worth it. But you're still growing. And I, I want to ask this question because uh, I was talking to my friend and he was like, yo, I want to open up a restaurant. I said, yo, that would be cool that I go online. Hard. And I'm looking at, they still, it's in big letters, restaurant is the worst business to open. It is. And it makes sense, I suppose, <laughs> because, like, for instance, I sell T-shirts. The T-shirts don't go bad. Mm -hmm. If I don't sell a T-shirt, it doesn't go bad. But in a restaurant, things can go bad, like, that you can't sell or, like, expiration dates. Um, so how do you run a successful business? Like, in terms of the, the numbers and business behind it. Like, really, I need, there's like a, the only reason I started this podcast is I get free coaching, okay? Because okay. I want to open a restaurant. <laughs> and um, I, I, I would like to know, how, like, what are some of the things that you would coach me on? Um, so, well, when it comes to restaurant, for me, fortunately, we don't have a lot of things that go bad. We have a lot of waste, right? Mm -hmm. Um be, the restaurant is always so busy. Mm -hmm. So if anything, we're running out of stuff and For we sure. got to recoup. So sure. I never had to worry about things not being pushed off the shelf because people want everything that we got. Mm -hmm. um, our, our issue is just waste, right? Like if, if, if the food was made wrong, if something fell and like waste costs money, mm -hmm. right? And waste add up, adds up. But I would tell you a few things if you wanted to start with a restaurant. Yeah. And it wouldn't actually be with restaurant operations. It would be one, making sure that you have a really good accountant Okay. Um, secondly, making sure you have a really good lawyer. The well, what's, what's the importance on the um, accounting? Yep, the accountant so that you can pay your sales and use tax. Because if you don't pay that, they will put a big orange sign on your door. You won't be able to open. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and, and here's a funny story. When I first started um, Slutty Vegan, I didn't pay my sales and use tax for the first month. And they called me like, hey, you started your Instagram in July, but we didn't get a payment. And it's all they on the ground. Oh, they don't play no games. Golly. Yeah. So making sure you have a good account to pay all your taxes because it's a nightmare if you don't. Right. Mm -hmm. And you you just want to give the the, the the state their money. Just give them mm -hmm. their money. Swallow that bullet. It's a lot of for money. Sure. But, um, you know, that money is going to budgets and mm -hmm. like all that good stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, getting an attorney to make sure that you have NDAs and you have handbooks and policies because people People will and can sue you, right? Um, in the restaurant business, you got people that just come in. Like, the turnover rate is just so high. Right. So sometimes people are looking for an opportunity for a come up. So making sure you have uh, an attorney to make sure that you're protected that way. Making sure that you have all your trademarks mm -hmm. representing you. Um, if you have any HR legal issues, that's necessary. Um, insurance, which we talked about earlier. Yeah. Making sure that you have the proper insurance and um, you pay for it and don't cut corners on that because God forbid something happens in your business, then you're protected because you've been paying your insurance. Right, right, right. Right? Um, that seems like so many expenses, but and if I'm not, oh, it is. if I'm right, the margins aren't that big. Um, it, not really. Sometimes it just depends. Restaurants are a cash flow business. So the more restaurants that you have, the more money that you'll see. Right. Right. Um, so if you're able to scale up and open multiple restaurants, then one restaurant could potentially pay for your corporate payroll. Mm -hmm. Then the other restaurants, like you can break down your costs. Oh. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and then just finding food items and raw ingredients that don't cost that much money before you open up a restaurant. What kind of re what kind of restaurant do you want to open? Um, it's so crazy. Shout out to this company. They got this uh, this uh, wing spot around the corner from my house. It's called uh, Drums and Flats. Mm -hmm. Drums and Flats. Yeah. Amazing food. And I was talking to them like, yo, I want a franchise. I want to <laughs> do that. Because their food is amazing. Customer service is awesome. So if y'all on Stone Mountain, make sure you go to Wings and Drums, Drums and Flats. And, but I'm like, I'm so nervous about all the stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of stuff. But what I would suggest to you is make sure that your menu is small. Mm -hmm. When I first started out, I had four items on my menu every day. I rotate my menu. I only have like five to six items every day now. I give the people what I want to give them. Why a small menu? Um, because people, it's information overload when you get a big menu. You ever been to a restaurant 
Think about like Cheesecake Factory. Yeah, right? like, I was there six years. I worked there six years. Oh, Absolutely. so you get what I'm 100%. saying? The menu is so humongous that we don't think that long. Yeah. The, the average human being is, think about technology. In the first 30 seconds, like if Instagram don't show us what we want to see, we right. keep it moving. Our attention span is so short. So you want to create something that's so simplified that people don't have to think too much. Like, let us think for you. So make your menu super small. Mm. And if you can duplicate the items on the menu and just change the sauce, if your raw ingredients aren't that expensive, then you'll start to be able to see more money. What are raw ingredients? Raw ingredients like flour, okay, sugar, gotcha, gotcha. stuff right. like that, right? Gotcha. So depending on what you do. And just making sure that that stuff is like super cheap. Um, and, and the quality, making sure that the quality is good too mm. so that you can be able to yield a return. Gotcha. Um, and then the biggest thing that I would tell you is it's not always just about the food, right? I put an emphasis on the brand because if you can build a brand, a brand will outlive a restaurant. So now I'm selling clothes, mm. right? Now I'm selling dips, mm. right? I'm selling big, like I'm selling things outside of just burgers and fries because build I'm the building brand. a brand, right? And your brand will get you in rooms that burgers and fries can't get you in. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? People will want to use the brand in movies. People want to license the name. People will want to do all of that. And if you can create something that's just bigger than just a restaurant and create a brand and a lifestyle around the brand, then people will buy into it and they will want to be attached to it at all times. Mm, makes perfect sense. Yes. Because, and I like the way you said it. You was like, yo, you'll have, the, the mindset is this actual business is to pay for expenses of other business, other yes. locations. I never thought about it like that. Yeah, and, and, and to think, so when we talk about the brand, um, I'm doing a cookbook. I, mm. I just signed a deal with Simon & Schuster. From the brand, mm. right? The name of the book is called Eat Plants, Bitch, right? Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's a book for the non-vegan who wants to sometimes casually eat vegan, right? That is me. I'm doing the documentary about how slutty vegans thrived in the pandemic. That's another stream of income for me. I'm working on a movie that's similar to Good Burger, which will be slutty vegan, but the modern Good Burger, right? It's an extension of the brand. Can I be in it? Of course, absolutely. <laughs> Y'all heard her. I'm be in the movie. I'm be a movie star. But I've been able to build up the brand. So anything that I want to do with the brand, I can. Right? I, I've done a partnership with Shake Shack. I've done a partnership with Morningstar. I'm working on some other big partnerships with some major companies right now because I built up the brand, and that ain't got nothing to do with burgers and fries. Mm. So when you want to do the restaurant, figure out a way that you can create an experience around that. Mm. Just like Bar Vegan. Bar Vegan is an experience. Yeah, we sell drinks and food, but when you come. It feels like a vibe. You're in an oasis. You ain't right. never seen a restaurant look this beautiful and nice and it just feels melodic mm. and the energy is just right. Um, so wow. that would be my advice to you. Goodness great. Yo, do you own the community app? Just tell the truth. No, but I need to. Yo, that, yo I see your ad every Everybody single day. <laughs> yo, they are, yo, they are dumping money. They, they put that. a lot of money into that. You know, it's funny. So I found out, research is everything. So I found out about community um, through the shade room, mm. actually. So the shade room had, and I said, I got to research. How did they do this? Um, and I and I found their number and I reached out to them. And obviously they were still in beta at the time. Mm. That's how fresh it was. And they was like, well, yeah, we only deal. I'm like, no, you got to deal with me. Let me tell you exactly <laughs> who we are. And they were intrigued and they allowed me to sign up. So for the first six months, I didn't even pay. Wow. Yeah, I was just winging it. And I figured it out and we started sending out marketing messages. I don't know if you want our text mm -hmm. thread. But we started sending crazy messages out to the consumer. And now here we are. We got about 17,000 people on that community oh. text message goodness where I can gracious. talk to the people and say anything that I want. We so ra raunchy on there. Like people love it though mm. because they can't imagine that a restaurant would have this style of guerrilla marketing. Goodness. So community saw how good we were doing and said, hey, we want to do a case study on you. And I said, sure, why not? They did a case study on me. And that's why you see me everywhere because they, they they did the research, did the case study, came in and filmed me. And I see myself every day on my timeline. Every I'm like, here day. I go again, here I go again. <laughs> but it was good exposure for me, right? Yeah. Um, and it gave people an opportunity to be able to sign up and find new ways to communicate with the consumer because consumers just want to be talked to. That's mm. it. Yeah. They just want to feel important. They want to feel like you, you care about them beyond it being transactional. Yeah. And that's what community has done for me. That was a deep plug. They're going to hear this. Right. They're going to love that. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Now, yo, you are just a wealth of knowledge. And I, I know you probably... Will you ever get into coaching like that? Because you don't really have a lot of time. But I, I did... It was like a, a dinner that you did that was really dope that I went to. And people just shot off questions and you answered. I thought that was just a vibe. Thank that you. Was dope. You know, COVID was a hater, so I had to stop that. But I'm, mm. I'm actually going to reignite that. So when we talk about, like, mentoring... 
I just like to give the free information. Maybe one day I may package it and put it in a workshop. Yeah. But right now, it's like the information is here to give. Like, I'm winning already. Like, yeah. I'm good. Like, I want other people to win. Um, so I get on my live sometimes to give the free information. Everybody asks me why I start a mentoring group. And maybe one day I will. Yeah. Um, but right now, again, I got so much stuff on my plate and so much stuff in my oh, belly. Damn. I'm just trying to... <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Clearly. I'm you want to take some time to... off? Um, I say yes, but no. I'm a working <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I have not taken a break in um, eight and a half months now. Like, I've not taken Goodness a break. Goodness gracious. Every day, I'm my schedule, my assistant, every single day, I got a million things to do. Um, but I'm used to, I'm the type of person where, like, I got to have a lot on my plate. If I don't, I'm like, what is wrong? <laughs> I don't know really? if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I was asking, <laughs> I, was, I was on uh, Twitter or something like that. And I was like, yo, I feel, I don't know if this is a toxic trait of mine, but... <laughs> If I go on vacation and I'm just sitting there and I'm relaxing, it's not relaxing to me. Yeah. Because I'm like, my mind, I have a good idea and I got to write down. And yes. other people look at it like, yo, that's work. And I'm like, am I, is something wrong with that? No. Because um, this doesn't feel like work for me. When you love what you do, yeah. it never feels like work. Right? And I tell people all that. Like, this is why I can't have a corporate job. Like, I, I don't want to clock in. I don't want to sit behind a desk. My... Friends laugh at me because if I'm on the phone and the call is boring, I fall asleep on the phone. <laughs> Am I lying here? <laughs> I literally, I will fall asleep. I don't care who I'm talking to. But like, if it's not captivating to me, right, I'll right, fall right. asleep. But I love what I do. Like, I love to create, right? Mm -hmm. So like all the technical stuff, like, I don't care about that. But like, I love to create and I love to see people happy about something that I created. And that is what brings me joy. So no, ain't nothing wrong with that. Good. All right, well, good. I, 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 I feel normal now. So, um, one, I, I just want to say thank you because I, I do have like a trillion more questions, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. But you are just, you're, you're like iconic. Thank you. Like there are people that are looking up to you like with your hair and just, just raw, just being yourself. And you don't like, you're, you're not, you're not pandering to anything. You know what I mean? Like I can imagine even in these corporate meetings, they have to cater. They have to conform to who you are. They think I'm crazy. I bet. I walk in the room like, what's up, y'all? How y'all doing? <laughs> They're like, who the hell? But I'm like that because, like, the dopest thing in the world, when I see people be themselves no matter where they are, not changing their voice, not changing who they are, not talking to people different, just being who you are, yeah. people going to love you for you. And... I think a part of the reason Slutty Vegan has been successful is because I've shown them a different side of entrepreneurship. I'm not your conventional CEO. Yeah. Like, I will literally tell you, if I ain't got it together, mm -mm, it don't look good. Like, I will tell you that and I'm transparent about that. And I'm never the type of person, like, everything is just beautiful because that's not true, yeah. right? But I want people to be able to come on a journey that sometimes may be beautiful and sometimes may be a little hectic, but at the end of the day, it's all worth it, so. You ever get afraid of how big things are getting? You get anxiety? Do you get nervous? Um, so I'm never scared, but there's something called beautiful fear, right? So to me, every day is like a marathon. So I wake up every day. At, here's my routine. I wake up every single morning and I check, well, I think first, I check my email, then I check my Instagram to make sure it ain't nobody trying to sue me. I'm not in the, <laughs> I'm not in the tabloids. Different nothing. problems. Yes. Right. Um, and then I check my bank account. <laughs> Every day. Every single day. My same routine. I wake up at like five o'clock in the morning every day. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's like a marathon. It's like people that are getting ready for the Olympics or for the Super Bowl. Like every day you get an opportunity to be a better version of yourself. I do so much and I still mm -hmm. feel like I'm not doing enough. Mm. I literally do a lot. And I'm like, dang, I could be doing more. But I'm like, wait, you got all of this stuff going on. You got all of these interviews. But I'm just wired that way. Um, and at the end of the day, I could sit and say, okay, Another day went by. But that's the beautifulness of being an entrepreneur. Right. You're challenged every single day. And every day doesn't look like yesterday. Yeah. And then you get to learn something. And then eventually you'll be able to inspire and teach other people like hopefully I'm doing with the people on this podcast. Absolutely. Are you acquiring any companies? Oh, well, I've invested um, in a couple companies. I've tried to acquire two. Um, both ended up declining, which is okay. Really? Yeah. What um, was the concepts? One was a vegan patty. They're actually doing pretty good now. Legacy. You want to say the name? Legacy? No, I'm saying, I don't care. Okay. Uh, Legacy Burgers. Mm. Legendary Burgers. Okay. They went with Shark Tank. Um, a word. Yeah, but they decided to go another route. They're doing well. They're black. And I wish them, mm -hmm, I wish them the best. Yeah. Um, and there was another company um, that, that I wanted to invest in, uh, Antlers Moreau. But they're also, they were on Shark Tank, too, also gotcha. doing well. Gotcha. So my mindset is like, what companies can I find that we can grow together? And we right. can build together? Right. Yes. Right. Um, 
where everybody doesn't have that same mindset, that's right? That's where my head is now, though, yeah. in terms of equity. That's why I'm asking the question. Yeah. So who did you invest in? Um, or what are some companies that so, you invested? So I won't say the name of this one because okay. I, I, I promise that I wouldn't, but it's basically a company that sells Black-owned products. Mm. Um, very popular. They do well. I invested in a company called Crystal Shea Raw. She, she has like Crystal a raw... Crystal Shea Raw. Uh-huh. She has a raw vegan restaurant. Okay, where's that? Um, where's her, um, her restaurant? Roswell. Oh, it's here in Georgia. Yeah. Crystal Shea Raw. Okay, shout yeah. out. Are you be up there, E? Oh, yeah. where? Oh, okay. Um, I invested in a t-shirt company called AMG. AMG. What's it stand for? It's in Atlanta. What's it stand um, for? Atlanta Merchandise Group. Okay. Shout yeah. out to AMG. So I invested in them. Um, I, I am about to invest in the Greenwood. Really? Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's dope. Um, yeah. And I invested in a cookie company, uh, a 15-year-old. She sells vegan cookies. So mm. I invested in her. Um, who else did I invest in? There's a couple more. But um, I, I like to be able to pour into other people and so, I'm going to do more of that, right? Um, and and I think that that's important because at the end of the day, success is like mud. You throw something on the wall, something going to stick, something yeah. going to work. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> so, so I get to do that. And, and I love to be able to put my name on things that are already buzzing and growing and doing well. Gotcha. Okay, I got, I got one last question where I do it. Before I do that, I got to do a quick commercial okay. um, for all of our episodes are sponsored by The Morning Meetup, which is uh, the only group that gathers. Let me tell you about it. TheMorningMeetup.com. We gather every single day. I coach entrepreneurs every single day, Monday through Friday. So I have a, a theme for the month. Like this month, what's this month's theme? Um, yeah, the six-figure philosophy. So I'm bringing on people who make um, six and seven figures to kind of sh- get people to, uh, not so afraid of six figures, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so every single call, every Monday through Friday, call supports the theme. So I'm bringing on really, really successful people. Mm-hmm. Literally, we have almost 400 people on the call every Ooh, single Oh, I want to come on month. one. Yes, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it's, it's a monthly membership. We read a book club. We have a book club. And okay. every every we always pick a book. Every day we read a chapter. So every morning after that day, we discuss the chapter. Mm-hmm. Like, what did we get from it? Mm-hmm. And um, literally, I read zero books last year. Mm-hmm. We're literally, uh, we read eight books so far oh, this year that. as a group. Hundreds of people every mm-hmm. single day. So go to themorningmeetup.com. Like like Y'all gonna see. Say it again. Put me on that. You wanna buy it? it? You wanna acquire me? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> How much you charging? You know, right? <laughs> so go to themorningmeetup.com. Dollar trial just to see if you like it. If you don't, if you want to stay, it's seventy nine dollars a month. Okay. If you don't want to stay, you can leave. It's cool. Seven day trial. Um, I, for a dollar, just try it out. Let me know. Okay. Cool. So I got one last question before I let you go. I mean, then you got to end us off with something powerful. Um, where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years, so that I can watch this interview and say, "Yo, I interviewed her five years ago, <laughs> and she said she was going to be doing this." And look at her now. Um, you know, I used to have a clear answer for that question mm-hmm. when people used to ask me that. But if you would have asked me that three years ago, I would have never imagined this, mm. right? But what I do know is Slutty Vegan will be a powerhouse name that will be alongside the big boys and even bigger than the big boys. Mm. Slutty Vegan will have a valuation of at least a billion dollars, <sighs> right? Um, Slutty Vegan and the foundation will be able to transform communities and be able to pour into communities and help other entrepreneurs build the, the dream that they always dreamt about, Um I see mm. Slutty Vegan having extensions with movies, with books. I see, I see a couple of books for myself, um, documentaries, and all things that fall under that umbrella. Um, I also already have Slutty Productions, so I see Slutty Productions wow. being one of the, the biggest record labels. Um, mm. And whatever it is, anything that I touch will turn to gold. Um, mm. Real estate is big for me, too. I've been getting in a real estate game, so I've nice. purchased a lot of real estate. Um, and I expect Slutty Vegan to have one of the biggest portfolios in the country um, within the next five to 10 years. But all in all, it's going to be big. So when you watch this in five years or less, yeah. you're going to say, damn, she said it and she yeah. did it because everything that I put my mind to, I do. Goodness gracious. Yeah. Listen, thank you so much. Um, please let everybody know how they can uh, get in touch with you. Absolutely. And yeah. How they can so 
if you want to come patronize Slutty Vegan, you can follow us uh, at www.sluttyveganatl.com or you can go to our Instagram page, Slutty Vegan ATL, or you can go to Bar Vegan ATL if you want to get a drink and some vegan food, or you can go to Pinky907 <laughs> if you want to get some inspiration, or you can go to one of three of my locations in Atlanta, or you can just come to this podcast and just hear me talk. That's a fact. That's a fact. <laughs> this was a beautiful, beautiful experience. I thank you so much because I know being in front and being the leader, um, I'm sure darts are being thrown at you, right? But you take them to protect everybody else to show, yes. listen, this is how we build. This is yes. how we run a professional company. I'm super inspired. So I know Thank there you. are grade school girls that are looking at you saying, I don't, I don't want to be a, uh, I don't want to be an actress. I don't want, I want to be a pinky. I want to yeah. be an entrepreneur. I want to, like, I just want to be this iconic figure. So thank you so much. You. And um, lastly, I'd love for you to close us out with, um, there's a young lady that is watching this that says, mm -hmm. I've been through the ups and downs and I'm really, really down right now in my background and all these other reasons why they can't be successful. i love for you to just kind of close us out with a word of wisdom. Absolutely. Um, so I'm talking to myself because I've been there, right? Um, so if you are an entrepreneur and you really have this dream to just be bigger than life, I'm going to tell you two things. First of all, own that room. Whatever room you walk into, hold your head up and be confident and, and own it. Like, don't be scared of nothing. Right. People are going to tell you, no, no, don't hurt those no's. Turn them into yeses and turn it on so that you can get everything that you want. Um, when you stay ready, you ain't never got to get ready. If you're always prepared, you'll always be ready for the opportunity when it presents itself. And like I said before, uh, when you take chances, you make advances. Literally, if you put yourself out on a limb and if you believe in yourself so much, Anything that you want in your life, you're going to get. No matter what you've been through, I don't care if you had a bad relationship. I don't care if you got zero dollars in your bank account. I don't care if you got some fake or phony friends. Put your mind and your brain together and do the work, and literally you'll be able to achieve your wildest dreams. And I'll see you at the top. Goodness gracious. You can't close it out no better than that. Yeah. Do me a favor, y'all. Go get you some <laughs> social proof. I mean, yes. I want you to build something. Put your mind, heart, sweat, tears into it. Go build something. But I need you to come back to your community and teach them how you did it. All right? Yeah. We are out of here. Peace. All right, look, I know you're enjoying the episode, but I got to tell you, finally, you asked for it, and we created a Patreon, okay? We created an inner circle. We have amazing stories, amazing information, the how-tos from the episodes. The only thing we're missing is a community. So... It's about that time. We put together our Patreon. We put together a community because we have to have conversation around the information. So even this podcast we're listening to right now, there needs to be conversation. I want to hear what you got. I want to hear what you got. Like, let's throw some stuff back and forth. And because we're like-minded, we're all going in the same direction. When we connect, connect in a community, we can connect on other stuff outside the community because we're building real relationships. Okay. So check out the Patreon. We got three tiers. I don't care what tier you join. Um, the support is, um, the support is appreciated.